Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our family and friends, the body of Christ from around the world. I'm coming to you from New York City. My name is Joshua Holmes. I am the director of the Young Christian Leadership Conference, as well as assistant pastor here at the Manhattan Family Church, right in the heart of New York City. We're excited that you're joining us today for our monthly webinar with the WCLC, the World Christian Leadership Conference, which has consistently and powerfully conducted these webinars every single month, addressing a powerful theme. This year's theme is empowering harmony, unity, and peace for a unified world. And I know many of you are here because you were so compelled by the specific topic that we're addressing today, which I'm so excited about, which is Godism, an end to history, an end to the history of war and conflict. So Godism, as we know, is as its most important task has the mission to witness and proclaim a historical living God in a modern atheistic era. It holds as its fundamental understanding that God as this incredible first cause has two fundamental characteristics of internal nature, external form, masculinity and femininity, and it's manifested and reflected in all of his creation and most profoundly in us as human beings. It provides a guide for us in our life, an ideal to strive for, and it provides a way for us to unite centered on a loving heavenly parent. So today we are excited to showcase how this task to solving our history of war and conflict is possible through Godism. We're going to be showcasing a way forward for the body of Christ to really bring about a unified, harmonious, peaceful world. And we have a wonderful program prepared for you and uh, prepared for all of us here with special panelists and authorities on this topic. And I pray that you can open your hearts to receive God's profound spirit, profound depth through his word. And I, in order to get us into that space, I want to begin with an opening song as we invite up the Takashima family to sing the song you say. <laughs>
Wow, 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 wow. Let's give a round of applause to the Takashima family. Beautiful song. I felt like I was seeing God, seeing God manifested in the beautiful parent-child relationship and the beautiful music. Thank you so much. Before we move on, I just want to remind you, for those joining through Zoom, if you see on the bottom the interpretation button, you can find the interpretation for the language. I know we're an international community. We are the World Christian Leadership Conference, so please find your language there. Moving forward, I'd like to open up for our opening prayer from Minister Laura Young. She's the director of the Korean Christian Leadership Conference, KCLC, and Secretary General of the North Korea Development Institute, NKDI. Please lead us in prayer. With the freshness of spring here in Korea, I'd like to say hello and good morning to you. May God bless you all and WCLC. Wishing you a life abundant and win your battle in the power of resurrection. I always thank you for your prayer for the unification of Korea. I owe you prayer and love for Korea. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, here we Christian clergy gather to pray for an end to war and conflict. Bless us participating in WCLC webinar today and hear our prayers. Oh my God who governs all the universe. Two years after the confrontation with COVID-19, we are just getting out of the shadow of COVID and recovering to our peaceful routine, but the ambush of war again keeps us away from peace. The prolonged war in Ukraine is causing more casualties and damages, as if returning to the Cold War era, there is the confrontation between the democracy and communism. We repent once again that conflicts here and there, along with the Russian invasion, were the result of the endless competition and greed of mankind to have more and to win against their opponents. We didn't realize that what we were pursuing was vain because we are only aiming for material abundance by undermining nature and living in our own opinion away from God. Let our ego die on the cross, die on the sin, and live on the spirit again. So let us live on the power of resurrection, as Jesus, the first fruit of resurrection. In the light of the Lord, we can see our sins, so that we confess we are sinner. Let the Apostle Paul's confession be our confession, and not the condemning voices and criticism to others, but the voices of recognition, and the compliment to others will be conveyed through WCLC. The whole world has been looking at the war in Ukraine and showing the power of the prayer of community against the war. This prayer is love for our neighbors and hope for humanity. I believe that this love will overcome the darkness and evil and bring about the ending of war. I also believe that God created our bodies fearfully and wonderfully to overcome all viruses and germs. Let us remind this and manage the environment not to be polluted anymore and take good care of our bodies and minds, the holy temple, and help ourselves restore the immunity that God has given us. Hopefully, mankind not give in to any virus in the future. Father God, please lead us and bless us. Let the heart of Jesus fill our mind so we can look at our neighbors as the masterpiece made by God. Through this in mind, we become the hands of Jesus to take care of our neighbors in need. Especially, let us do our duty as Good Samaritan toward Ukraine. May our heart be filled with harmony and mutual prosperity, not with the selfish and greed anymore, and let us become full of scent of Christ in our daily lives and serve others as faithful stewards in God's grace and fulfill our mission that making our land kingdom of God was full of justice and love. Hope our everyday life be a worship toward God. Let the WCLC smiles and comforts to the world as all together Christian, not always Christian. I pray it in the name of Jesus who is helping us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Aju, thank you, Minister Laura Young. 
for that prayer. Wow, that was almost the message for today. We have more to come. <laughs> yeah. So I want to invite up now Reverend Jean Dedou, the pastor of the Kindness Church of God based in Vancouver, British Columbia, an interdenominational community church with a mission to reach out to broken and hurting people and support their healing journey. He will be reading our scripture for today, as well as words from Father and Mother Moon. Well, thank you so much. Isn't it, I'm reading this from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and letters to the Hebrew by St. Paul the Apostles, chapter 10, 24 to 25. And let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to the good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as he see the day approaching. The time is light for Godism Founders addresses of the Youth Federation for World Peace, July 26, 1994, by the Reverend Sun Myung Moon. We have to realize that the crisis of our global society stem from our neglect of God. Communism failed because it denies the existence of God. America likewise will suffer greatly if she does not reclaim her spiritual heritage. Even Christianity, when it loses sight of God, it powers to stop the decline of our global community. Diverse fields such as philosophy, economics, politics, and the art can already attain their true potential when they are applied in service to God. Thus, the key to solving today's problems is to find God. A keen awareness and a comprehensive understanding of God's will provide the only solution to the crisis we are facing today. A model of the ideal family and world peace by Dr. Hack Jack Han Moon, hoping that we are all come to have close ties to God and the true parents, that we can that we can establish the true family and the true global culture in a reading role centered on the God's true love and that we can build a peaceful world and the united world for the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Jean Dadu. Thank you so much for those words you shared with us today. Powerful. Now I want to invite up the chairman of WCLC, Dr. Ki Hoon Kim for a welcoming remark. I've actually had just had the opportunity to be with Dr. Bishop Kim in Korea this past week. And I was reminded again, Dr. Kim, of why I respect and admire your leadership. I can see clearly how Mother Moon trusts you so much. And she has trusted this mission of chairing WCLC to you. And we're so grateful for your resoluteness, resoluteness to this vision. It's truly a rare, a rare thing to see in this world today. And it's so honorable. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Please, uh, we're, all, we're ready you. to hear from you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Minister uh, Joshua Hong and his wife, Takayo Hong, uh, as a staff members of WCLC. Uh, you and your wife's uh, great dedication uh, for the sake of others uh, inspire. Uh, me and uh, around us once again, thank you. Uh, I just came back from uh, Korea last night. Uh, when I left Korea, uh, temperature around 80 degree. And now I see Chicago this morning, uh, 37 degrees. So uh, around 40 degree difference 
uh, between Korea and here in Chicago. Uh, but uh, in uh, God's world, we have no differences. Still, we are one family under God. Why uh, did I uh, go to Korea? And we have a special uh, meeting uh, centering on founder of uh, WCLC, uh, Mother Moon, and we plan a seven days uh, international leadership conference uh, for the sake of God's providence around the world. And we had a plan seven days. However, uh, Mother Moon suggested world is in crisis. Yes, I like to hear each one of you, your report from your nation and your continent. But however, today we must come together, one heart, one mind centering on God, let us pray. And we never had experience 500 international clergies and leaderships gathered together one place, special education centering on Mother Moon and prayer condition from 8 p.m. to 3 a.m. You know, all our leaderships, we are very shocked. And however, the outcome is incredible. You know, we all experienced great spiritual awakening. I never a uh, long time pray until 3 a.m. Yes, today WCLC, we trying to ending the history of war and conflict. How we come together and empowering harmony, unity, and peace for all unified world. And I got the very deep experience of praying together 500 people shouting and standing up. I see my own eye, people is jumping up and down. I think that is, I believe, um, our minister, young man, Joshua Holmes, and his wife, hand in hand, jumping and shouting, and we I pray endless with our almost heart. We show God, we pray today for the sake of this conflict and suffering people around the world. So please give us answer and power and we will move on centering on you, not somebody else. Centering on you, we will move forward. So unforgettable experience. So I am very appreciate. Uh, thank you, uh, our founder, Mother Moon, and all international leadership and uh, Korean uh, leaderships as well. And one more thing, uh, unforgettable experience our dear brothers and sisters from Korea, uh, Korean Christian Leadership Conference, KCLC, uh, Chairman uh, Dr. Suman Kim and his wife, Reverend Jung Yeon Kim, and uh, Chairman uh, Minister Laura Yang. They hosted uh, around uh, over uh, 10 pastors, we gathered together having uh, lunch and we discussed how uh, Mother Moon invested Africa. And we all looking for come together, uh, Africa for the sake of God's will. So WCLC, in near future, we really want to come together and visit one country of uh, Africa and support uh, from America and Korea, Japan and around the world, how uh, our founder, Mother Moon, uh, love and 
her heart. So in a long time, and I heard many times uh, Father Moon mention what is the best education in the world. That is knowing God, knowing God. And today, uh, Mother Moon mentioned why we faced so many conflict and many problems because we don't know God's idea, essential God's ideas. We don't know essential of Jesus. This is the most regions we faced with conflict problems. This means Father Mother Moon taught to us knowing God and practicing God's idea and we call Jesus love, living for the sake of others, sacrificing ourselves for the sake of others. This is best teachings and practicing, inviting people into our world, God-centered world and peaceful world. And we continue this year, how can we bring unity around the world. So we are very honored and happy invite the best uh, professor and teachers and who are practicing uh, this principle around the world. Dr. Thomas Wu, president of Unification Theological Seminary. He was my teacher on Godism. I don't know how I did well. And Dr. Thomas Wood, I don't know, remember me, but uh, I really impressed and I focused. And my grade I got from him, A. So that means I was a good student to his class. And uh, the other ones, a uh, professor, uh, William uh, Lay. He's not only prof professor, but he's a very well known prominent lawyer in New York area. Still, I working with him, not because I have legal problem, because we work together hand in hand for the sake of God's providence. And I have another uh, greatest, uh, one of the greatest women, Ms. S. Uh, uh, Tomiko Dogan. Uh, we work together long, long time, UPF and many other projects together here and internationally. So I am very honored we have so experienced uh, professors and uh, actual a ground front line, and we will bring a great outcome from our monthly webinar. Once again, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for your dedication. God bless you all, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Thank you so much for our chairman. You warm our hearts, Dr. Kim, and I was honored to be there praying with you until 3 a.m. <laughs> God bless. Thank you so much for your prayers. So we're going to jump right into our panelists. Again, the context of this is that our world is in crisis. And as Dr. Kim stated, quoting Father Moon and Mother Moon, the greatest education is to understand God. It's to understand God. So we're going to dive deeply into Godism at this time. And our first speaker is, yes, Dr. Thomas Ward, President and Professor of Peace and Development at the Unification Theological Seminary. I am his student there. Uh, I had the honor of taking his classes there. I was certainly not the best student. I can't claim that as Dr. Kim can, but he's such an incredible leader, incredible leader. Over the course of his career, Dr. Ward has traveled between the United States and Korea more than a hundred times. He's visited North Korea twice, where he met the DPRK officials, including North Korea's founding leader, Kim Il-sung. 
In 92, Dr. Ward played a significant role in an important track two peace initiative inspired and supported by Father and Mother Moon. This led to the unprecedented decision by North Korea to suspend its annual Hate America Month, observed each year from June 25th to July 27th. So you can say that Dr. Ward is world-class, but also moving the entire world forward for the sake of peace. Please help me in welcoming up our professor, our president of UTS, Dr. Thomas Ward. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pastor Holmes. Uh, you've made me very nervous now, but I will, uh, I will do my best. I hope that what I have to share today will be of use to everyone. Um, yes, I'm going to be speaking today on the topic, uh, Thoughts on Godism and uh, the Ending of the History of War and Conflict. Uh, I hope that what I say will be of use to everyone. And I would like to give you some uh, context, first of all, about Godism. Godism can also be referred to as unification theory. And Godism has its roots in the Bible and in the Christian tradition, divine principle, the teachings of Reverend Moon, unification thought, unification critique and counterproposal to Marxism, and the speeches and writings of Reverend Sun Myung Moon and Dr. Hak Jahan Moon. Uh, this is a picture of Reverend Moon, a very young Reverend Moon, and standing beside him is Dr. Sang Hun Lee, a medical doctor that uh, Reverend Moon collaborated with so much in terms of the development of unification thought. And um, this, this text that you see there is Unification Thought, which was published in the English language for the first time in uh, around 1972, I believe it was. There are so many publications dealing with unification thought, literally hundreds of them. I just put up a few. I just wanna make the point that this is something which has been researched seriously by scholars for uh, some five decades now. And uh, we have had a, a variety of seminars, particularly some, we've had literally hundreds of seminars as well and symposia all around the world. Uh, but also uh, at the University of Bridgeport and at UTS, where I've taught for a number of years, we've had numerous seminars over the years. And I'm happy to say that Dr. ki -hun Kim has been very active in those efforts. And he is, as, as he put it really, uh, he, he's a serious student of unification thought. And he's a wonderful person, I think, to be uh, opening today's seminar and guiding WCLC as a whole, an outstanding leader and also a, a great scholar. And I also want to uh, mention that our, our host today, Pastor Holmes, also has been involved in unification thought. And I was privileged to have him as one of my students last term. And he was also a very good student following in the tradition of Dr. ki -hun Kim. Our topic today is ending the history of war and conflict. The universe is based on laws of conflict versus laws of harmony. There are different perspectives on this. Uh, if you look at Marxism and the Marxist dialectic, it is a model that looks at the universe based on conflict. Friedrich Engels said that all things in our universe exist in a relationship of opposites. He felt that protons and electrons were opposites. He described male and female as opposites. And he said that there was a state of temporary unity, but a state of constant contradiction. And the type of relationship that existed between these different opposites was one of subject subject, meaning that both sides kind of wanted to be in charge, so to speak. Uh, the type of dynamic, the type of metaphysics outlined to us by uh, Engels is the basis, I believe, in many ways for a dysfunctional family. If neither husband or wife can listen to each other, can reciprocate to each other, we know what the consequences are. And interestingly, in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels predicted the collapse of the family because they saw the, the family through that type of a lens. Godism, however, is a model that's based on reciprocity. It doesn't say that men and women are opposites. It says that they are complementary to each other. It doesn't say that proton and electrons are opposites in conflict but they are complementary to each other. And there's a dynamic reciprocal give and take action. And based upon this approach, centering upon God, man and woman are destined to create 
a harmonious, loving family, which is the seed, likewise, to be able to have a healthy community, a healthy nation, and likewise, a healthy and safe world. The culture of violence in our fallen world ultimately can be addressed, we believe, through harmonious, God-centered, eternal, blessed marriage. And we believe that there are four realms of heart that can be developed in a true family. There's the love that we first of all receive from our parents, and that allows us to develop what unification, what Godism refers to as object consciousness, to be able to feel the heart of our parents, to be able to feel the heart of God in a sense that we know, if I do this, which is a violation of God's commandment, it will break God's heart. Or if I, if I violate this, which is something my parents asked me not to do, I'll break their hearts. I don't want to break my parents' hearts. And so we begin by developing this heart of filial piety, wanting to inspire God, wanting to inspire our families. And based around that, we develop within our family a context, a way to love our siblings from our parents' viewpoint. And that leads to us being able to form families where there's a true love between husband and wife, and ultimately a love of parents, where parents stand as God's representatives, and they have a longing heart towards their children, and they have a longing heart, likewise, towards their siblings and towards their own parents. Interestingly, Harvard sociologist Robert Sampson makes a very important observation about the way in which towns are composed and what makes them safe or not safe. He makes the observation that neighborhoods, towns, and cities are more likely to flourish when they are sustained by lots of married households. What that means is if there are a lot of married, stable couples in any given community, that's going to be the key to making that a safe community. He says, family structure is one of the strongest, if not the strongest predictor of variations in violence across cities in the United States. So this just really um, supports the statement that I made about the centrality of the family. You might ask the question, how is Godism's focus different than the tradition of religious philosophy and Western philosophy in particular? If you look at the Western tradition, unfortunately, it's a kind of a cold, intellectually based tradition. I'm not saying that there are not many fine points. There are so many fine points, but Jesus was not just intellectual. Nevertheless, the most central core of Western tradition is an intellectual tradition. God himself, even in the Western tradition, has presented as being omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. That is, God is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good. Is that a God we can love, or is that a God we're going to have a tendency to fear? if we see God through that particular lens. Human beings, Western tradition teaches, have intellect, emotion, and will. But Western tradition and Christianity so often puts intellect first. We refer to human beings in the West as homo sapiens, wise men, wise homonoids. The most important thing is to be wise. But is reason enough to cure the problems of our world and end conflict? Godism says, no, you can't do it just with reason. Look at the most important figures of the 20th century. A person like Gandhi, who literally changed the fate of hundreds of millions of people. Or Dr. Martin Luther King, who also made a huge impact upon tens of millions of people. Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, all of them, they used an affective, a love-based approach characterized by service, forgiveness, and sacrifice of self to make those incredible inroads in the ways in which they did. What determines whether a person is good or evil? Their intellectual capacities? Do you say this person is really a good person because he or she is really smart? No, we don't say that. In reality, what determines whether a person is good or evil is love. If we feel love from someone, if someone has loved us, we say, oh, that's really a good person. I have so many wonderful memories about the way in which he or she took care of me. So is intellect or emotion more important in addressing division? Quite simply, emotion. Conflict or division stems from hurt, including historical hurt. Ideological differences pale in comparison to deep-seated hatred and resentments, as we all understand. Reverend Sun Myung Moon made the following observation. If we analyze our mind, we find that it has the functions of intellect, emotion, and will. But what is the most fundamental among these three? It is neither will or intellect, but emotion. 
The emotional relationships of fallen human beings have yet to be established centering on God. That is why intellect was brought to the front as a means and way to recreate this relationship in fallen human beings. However, originally intellect does not come first, emotion should come first. That is why it should be emotion, intellect, and will, rather than intellect, emotion, and will. You need to clearly understand this point. Human beings, Dr. Sang Hun Lee, who worked with uh, Dr. Sun Myung Moon on unification thought, he said we shouldn't be referred to as wise, wise persons. We should be referred to as persons of love, beings of love. That's the most important thing. And that's also what determines good or evil. Consider the words of Confucius. He said, at 15, I set my heart, not my, not my intellect, my heart upon learning. At 30, I had planted my feet firm upon the ground. At 40, I no longer suffered from perplexities. At 50, I knew what were the biddings of, hev of heaven. At 60, I heard them with a docile heart. At 70, I could follow the dictates of my own heart, not my mind, my own heart, not my intellect, for what I desired no longer overstepped the boundaries of right. He had become a truly good person based on the discipline and the way in which he had approached life. When Thomas asked Jesus, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. But what is the way that Jesus showed us? There's so many things, there are theological points that we can show, but some of the most indelible, indelible points of the point that, of, of the stories that Jesus showed, of the life that he lived, were affective, were, were based upon emotion. The, the story about, about the good shepherd, what kind of heart is that? The, the shepherd who's worried, he doesn't say, oh, 99 of my children are, are healthy or well. But instead, he thinks one of them is sick. One of them is afflicted. I can't have peace until that one finds peace. I'll never find peace until then. And likewise, the prodigal son, what an amazing story. You know, the prodigal son comes before his father, uh, not, not even really based upon anything, but realizing, well, I'd be eating much better if I was in my father's home as a servant instead of working in this pigsty where I am. And he returns to his father. His father runs to him and wants to rebuild the heart of his son, wants to reconstruct his son, wants to love and embrace his son and welcome, and welcome him home. In Matthew 20, 20 to 28, the sons of Zebedee, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and asked whether her two sons could sit to the right and left to Jesus. And he answered, it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. A few days later, we know that, that, that Jesus prepared for his own death on the cross. And he gathered those disciples in the upper room just a few hours before he headed to Gethsemane. And he washed each of their feet. And what did he say? He said, when he had finished washing their feet, he put his clothes and, on his clothes and returned to his palace. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. This is part of the way, the truth and the life that Jesus is showing to us. Jesus' way was the way of the heart, the way of service, the way of love. Now, to close, let me mention that there are two freedoms and there are two senses of peace. There is freedom as per the Constitution. That's a great freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion or belief, freedom of the press. And, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt added two more, freedom from want and freedom from fear. However, there's another type of freedom as well. And that is, Godism teaches that one of the greatest outcomes of genuine love is freedom. Have you ever had a time in your life when you've been able to really fully share your heart with someone, share a burden with someone? And don't you walk away saying, I feel so free inside. That's true freedom. The purpose of the external freedom is to be able to realize the true freedom. And that is one of the byproducts of really 
a relationship of genuine love with God and a genuine and relationship of genuine love with our parents, with our, with our siblings, with our colleagues. And there's two senses of peace. Peace is the absence of war and conflict, but there's also an inner peace, the same thing that somehow you're able to share your heart, unburden yourself, and an incredible peace comes upon you as you have never known before. This is Lund's curve. Those of you who've studied peace and development studies, that's the area which I teach in. I love Lund's curve because it really calibrates the levels of peace. And uh, if you look at US-China relations, the relationship between US-China can be char characterized as a stable peace. What is a stable peace? Well, as long as you talk about trade, as long as you, as you, as you, as you talk about certain types of concerns at the UN, et, et cetera, in certain areas, you can have a very normal relationship, a very collaborative relationship. But then talk about human rights violations in Hong Kong or talk about China's plans for Taiwan. And suddenly you move from stable peace to unstable peace. And from there, things can go on and on. My point is this, that actually with the true inner peace, what we are really seeking is what Lund's Curve des describes as a durable peace. It's a peace where you can finally be able to share everything, completely share and, and completely trust each other and trust the intention of the other. The, the sense of guardedness is no longer there. The fall, Godism explains, was a tragedy in history that distorted our inner sense of freedom. The original distortion of the heart is the major source of conflict. Godism emphasizes the restoration of heart begins with the restoration of the relationship between husband and wife, a blessed couple, a blessed family, a blessed community, and a blessed world. That is, I believe, the fundamental focus if we're going to address conflict, we have to really look at it, I believe, through uh, the type of perspective, I think, which Godism contributes to the broader discussion on this matter. I thank you all very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Thank you so much for such a, a powerful sharing today. I've gained so much. And one of the things I'm holding on to is you're explaining that it's really about serving others. Godism is about living the way that Jesus lived. And I remember taking my UTS course with Father Jacob David, and he said that Jesus is really defined by the word compassion, to suffer with one another, to love one another in that way, and we can change the world, beginning with the family, the individual and the family, extending to the world. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Next, I'm going to invite up Professor William Lay. He is an attorney and former director of the School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Bridgeport, where he also served as a chair of the Criminal Justice and Human Security Program and as president of the Faculty Council. He's a graduate of Columbia Law School. He was a senior editor of the Columbia Law Review and a Harlan Fisk Stone Scholar for all of his semesters there. He clerked for Judge Joseph W. Bellicosa of the New York Court of Appeals and practiced law for 12 years before he started his own law office in 2005. Again, he is another professor of mine and largely focusing on the content of Godism. And what touched me the most was his vigor and his zest and his excitement about bringing this content to this generation and especially to our young leaders. So please help me in welcoming up Professor William Lay. Good morning, members of the World Clergy Leadership Conference. It's really an honor for me to be with you this morning. Thank you for asking me to share a little bit about what is Godism. And in thinking about what Godism is, I think we have to begin with the story of the two thieves that were crucified with Christ. And the story is told in, uh, in Luke 23. It says, and one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, answering rebuked him saying, dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, 
And Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. This story gives rise, this, these events give rise to two trends in human history. The religious tradition, where one malefactor says, I deserve what I'm getting, but my hope is in God. And the other tradition says, that's foolishness. You know, if you're the Messiah, save yourself and save us and mocks and mocks God. In the last 400 years, we have seen this religious tradition develop through the Reformation, the Great Awakening and the American Revolution into Western democracy today. Western democracy is not flawless, but look at its roots. Look at these great documents of American history, the Mayflower Compact, which begins with the words, in the name of God, amen. And it tells that for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, uh, they, had, they had undertaken this voyage and they do solemnly and mutually in the presence of God combine themselves into a civil body politic. They were consciously bringing God into the state for the general good of the colony. We promise all due submission and obedience. It's the first time this had ever been done in history. And the first constitutional document that established a political state, the fundamental orders of Connecticut. Where did it come from? It was based in large part on Thomas Hooker's sermon of May 31st, 1638, taken from Deuteronomy 113. Choose wise, understanding, and experienced men according to your tribes, and I will appoint them your heads. So they wanted to invoke God's presence when they were appointing their leadership. And what about the great fundamental document of American history, the Declaration of Independence? It recognizes divine providence. It recognizes nature and nature's God. In writing about that document, the great transcendentalist preacher Theodore Parker wrote, by democracy, I mean not the democracy of the parties, not the squabbling that we see around us, but it is that ideal government, the reign of righteousness, the kingdom of justice, which all noble hearts long for. Theodore Parker saw American history as a, a, a progress toward that great ideal, and he inspired Lincoln. That's why Lincoln was willing to say, I know the founders had their flaws, but we are moving in the direction of a great ideal, all noble hearts long for and labor to produce, the ideal whereunto mankind slowly draws near. The American Revolution and American history is an attempt to prove by experience this transcendental proposition, to prove that we can organize ourselves centering upon God. That has been, the, the, the flowering and the fruit of the religious tradition. It's flawed. It's like the malefactor who was crucified with Christ, but it aspires to something great. Well, the humanistic tradition also aspires to greatness. The problem is it, it excludes God. In the Renaissance, we see great art, great music. In the Enlightenment, we see very brilliant philosophers. Where does it go? It goes to the, the French Revolution and the reign of terror based on an anti-religious revolution, a revolution where the enemies of the, of the revolution are destroyed. And that becomes the model for every communist revolution. In the Communist Manifesto and other writings, it is explained that the ideal of communism requires that humanity be entirely freed from belief in God. It's a superstition that enslaves humankind. Furthermore, history is viewed as a history of exploitation. No, they don't see God working in history. It's one class exploiting another. It's one race exploiting another. And how's it ever gonna end? Well, in the fiction of communism, in the final phase of history, a class emerges which will seize power, destroy its enemies, take control, but will not exploit. That hasn't happened and it won't happen without the spirit and heart of God. That is the fictitious proletariat class to achieve its ends. The destruction of all culture and institutions is justified and even required. And that's why communism has undertaken what the, what is called the long march through the institutions and has wreaked havoc in the institutions of the West. 
Today, we don't see the Soviet Union anymore. We don't see the communist states of Eastern Europe. We still have the People's Republic of China, which is ruled by the Chinese Communist Party. We still have uh, communist North Korea. But in a sense, the, the, the age of the communist political states may have passed in some sense. However, uh, the, the communism is still making its long march through our institutions. And uh, uh, this is probably something that we have to be more concerned with. So what is Godism? Godism is the unifying worldview. Godism is the worldview that can bring these two malefactors together. Democracy is not perfect, but it looks to God for its salvation. Communism is not totally wrong in its critique of some of the abuses and excesses of the West. However, God's, however, the two thieves, you know, who's in the middle of those two thieves? It's Christ. It's only by coming to God that we can unify those two trends and achieve what we are trying to achieve. Amazing. Thank you, Professor William Lay, for that incredible explanation of Godism. Another kind of approach and explanation furthering our understanding of Godism. It's powerful to hear specifically this point that we can and we have in the past been able to build nations and build a world that's centered on God. And when we do so, it creates a unifying factor that brings the world together. We need that. We desperately need that in our world today. Thank you, Professor Lay. Finally, our last panelist for today is our very own Mrs. Tomiko Duggan. She is the Senior Vice President of the Universal Peace Federation, UPF USA, and the USA Coordinator for the Interreligious Association for Peace and Development, IAPD. She has traveled to more than 70 nations, organizing conferences, symposiums, fact-finding tours, which brought together opinion leaders, educators, and media professionals with world political leaders. Her current work for UPF USA involves the creation and organization of educational leadership programs focused on connecting religious leaders through interfaith dialogue and addressing the roles of faith leaders from different cultures, races, religions, and nationalities. It's important work that she's doing. And she may not have been my professor, but her work has influenced me dearly. I knew Mrs. Duggan maybe before she ever knew me, simply because of a very common expression that goes around by her very famous name, which is that Mrs. Duggan is an incredibly powerful woman of God. She's a builder and a shaker, and I'm so excited that we get to hear from you today. Please help me in welcoming up Mrs. Duggan. Uh, Minister Joshua Holmes, thank you very much for your kind introduction. I'm grateful to participate in this wonderful meeting, this virtual gathering of God-loving and peace-loving clergy members, faith and civic leaders. This webinar theme, Godism, and in the history of war and conflict, conflict called us to fundamentally reconsider how we approach solving the most challenging problems we face as individuals, families, societies, and nations. We are currently consumed by the daily reports of the horrors of the war in Ukraine. What is so painfully ironic is this conflict is between peoples of shared culture, ethnicity, political history, and religious tradition. They know each other through language marriage, military training, and economic ambitions. Truly a war between brothers. I was privileged to uh, travel to all, over 60, uh, across the 70 different nations during the Cold War period, when the divisions and hostilities created by the Iron Curtain were very real. I had opportunity to observe the refugee camps and the conflict in the Southeast Asia, oppressive social and economic restrictions created by communist authorities in the Soviet bloc nations, the violent dis uh, disruption to life in Nicaragua and the Central 
America created by conflict against armed revolutionaries. In South Africa, the corrosive injustices created by the apartheid system. During this time, I got to know my fellow panelists on this webinar, Dr. Ward and Mr. Lay, in their early incarnations as lecturers and educators, presenting refining presentations of a critic of Marcus Leninist thoughts and counter proposals, as you heard, identified as a godism. If you wish to explore more the different logic of Godism from their presentation, it will be spiritually, intellectually enriching. I, however, would like to speak to you about the approach to Godism that is directly and immediately available to us all. When the communist world of the Soviet Union was still considered as a viable alternative to Western democracies, my colleague Larry Muffet, I escorted five top Soviet journalists on fact-finding tours to Japan and Korea. This was a part of a build-up to the 11th World Media Conference in Moscow and the meeting between the Father Moon, Reverend Samyon Moon and his wife, Mother Moon, Dr. Hak Jihan Moon, and the President Gorbachev. One of journalists was Natalia Yakublev. She was a director of a novelty agency. After some time in Korea, we are in Korea, she expressed genuine shock in seeing the amount and the variety of high quality available merchandise. She told me, what have we done in my country? After the Bolshevik revolution, we believed that the Soviet Union would bring about workers' paradise. Yet we do not have anything comparable to what I now see in Korea. About this country, Korea, we don't hear much about it. It was one of the poorest nations in the world at the end of the Korean War. This country, far prosperous and the people are enjoying the benefits of this wealth so much more than my country. She lamented this fact and expressed a deep dis discouragement for her country's future. Until that heartfelt conversation with Natalia, I only thought about criticizing Russia and the Soviet Uni Union and coolly analyzing their limitations and failures. Now I understood this woman had the same hopes, ambitions, and ideas for her life and her country as I did for mine. Sorry, <laughs> reminding me of her. My criticism of her social structure and ideas now meant so much less than our heart to heart connection. <laughs> that and many other experiences changed my thinking about peacemaking. In April 2020, when the COVID-19 virus was being widely detected and rapidly spreading as a devastating global uh, pandemic. Medical researchers were scrambling for understanding. People are dying in daily increasing numbers. Normal social relations were disappearing or be constrained, fear, isolation, and question were becoming the guiding principles of life. Humanity was threatened. The enemies were invisible. No solutions were available. I deeply felt God's intervention was somehow required. I was reminded of George Washington's desperation at the time of greatest challenge, kneeling in prayer in the freezing cold of snow, seeking divine guidance and help. 
I especially felt that the problems was universal and need to be addressed by more than the limits of one faith community. The interfaith prayer for the nation and the world was, was then initiated as a program to provide spiritual support for those suffering from COVID. For those whose loved ones were dying and as a resource and nourishment for the faith leaders were guiding the communities through their, this crisis. The voices of rabbis, Christian ministers, and imam, imams were quickly joined by Hindu priests, Buddhist monks, and adherents to other faiths. We have heard, learned from the voices of Jewish cantors, the intense re reading of passages from New Testament and the, the Quran and the chant of Buddhist monks and the Hindu priests. We have expanded our understanding of how God speaks universal truth to us through the voices of many faiths. Through shared prayer, we experience much more than the theological insight of a believer. We experience the intimacy and their love of God, of holiness. It is always a humbling experience. The Interfaith Prayer, the Nation for the World program is held every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. April 29 will mark the 108th continuous week of the prayer program. The need for shared offered prayers has grown during the last two years as we have experienced suffering from the exposure of the un resolved racial just in just racial prejudice revealed during the black life mothers protest and now from the suffering created by the war in ukraine so approaching the solutions offered by godism by knowing and loving god and all his principles and creations allow us to recognize and respond to the fact that God is central to our lives. Peace and peacemaking depends on our ability to build on that primary relationship and find love for others as our brothers and sisters from the same creator. Archbishop Stalin's uh, stirrings essentially eloquent, our passionate moderator for our interfaith prayers has a mantra. People pray to change things. Prayer changes people. People can change things. It is one of the many revolutions that appear as a result of participating in the interfaith prayer program. The interfaith prayer for the nation and the world has brought us to an awareness and consideration of to whom we are praying. We pray to a being of higher power and capability. Why and what should we be praying for? What the world needs from God and what God needs from us. Recognition that we all seek to bring peace, unity, not the separation, harmony, not division. The peace must bring justice to all. Recognition that we are all from the common origin of goodness. Prayers show we have more in common than we have differences. What makes people different is not the essential. Life is more precious than disputing dogma or the dif differences in scriptural interpretation. There is a richness of life through finding God and in service to others. Life is more complete with a shared awareness of God in our lives, how poor we are if we do not have a personal relationships with God. God has a character personality, and we seek relationship and knowledge of that character and the personality. We may have different rituals, languages, and songs, but belief in God is a unifying, a place to begin relationship. We pray for someone to respond to our prayer. 
interfaith prayer and dialogue inspire religious leaders who seldom hear or talk to other religious leaders. There is a common foundation for all faith leaders that commitment to God and service to others create social good, the basis of a good family and the way to pursue good governance. I want to close by the words, the Mother Moon, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, the founder of the Interreligious Association for Peace and Development, quote, I believe faith leaders will play a unique and vital role. They are entrusted by God as a moral compass by providing their wisdom, valuable lessons in the ending divisions, hatred, selfish, selfish ambitions, by demonstrating, demonstrating the love of others. We are called to live for the sake of others. We are one family under God. God owes parents to all. Thank you for providing this opportunity to share my experiences and thought. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tomiko Duggan. Thank you so much for your heartfelt and also profound sharing I'm deeply moved by your story, your experience, this walk of life that you've lived. And I'm reminded of just how important it is for the heart and heart connection. I think you also showed us a very practical step. I'm reminded from Dr. Rouse uh, in January. He said, you know, what I, what I feel is the issue in our world today is that we've forgotten how to pray. And you're reminding us through your example, Mrs. Duggan, that the power and the importance of prayer with interfaith especially so I feel we've been given an incredible lay of the, the land of Godism and how it can end war and conflict. Dr. Ward, you shared with us the importance of having uh, an affect mind or a heartistic heart, a mind behind Godism. And then Professor Lay showed us that in practice in America and beyond. And um, Mrs. Duggan, you showed us a practical first step that we can take, which is to pray with one another. If we're going to connect with God, if we're going to ground in God, we have to pray. We have to pray. So I'd like to invite up now for her reflection, Dr. Tanya Edwards, reflecting on these three speeches. She is the Director of International Affairs for WCLC. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Tanya. Thank you, Minister Holmes. Uh, it's wonderful to hear all of these lectures today. I want to quickly go over <clears throat> some of the things we had heard today. Godism, the ending of the history of war and conflict with uh, Dr. Thomas Ward. Godism is emphasizing on love. The laws of conflict in the US and us laws of harmony, one of subject, both sides wanting to be in charge. Two freedoms, two symptoms of peace. The freedoms per the constitution, the peace her godism. Thank you for Professor Lay. We thank you for your input and your wonderful words. What is godism? Referred to started with two thieves that he spoke about as in Luke 23. Talked about religious tradition, humanity tradition. Heard about the Mayflower conflict and uh, processing we can organize, proving we can organize centering on God. And we talked about communism in the world and still <clears throat> marching through our institutions. Tamika Duggan, thank you very much. Godism is spiritually and intellectual. The head of the Korean conflict we heard and from a heartfelt message. George Washington gave his greatest challenge was seeking divine guide, guidance. God speaks universal truths to us every day. Prayer changes people and people can change things. Thank you, God bless. Thank you, Dr. Tanya Edwards. Thank you so much. So this has been a powerful uh, webinar and uh, I hope everyone has been deeply moved and we're gonna move into the closing here and I want to invite up, uh, you know, this is just the beginning. Everything is the start. And uh, we want to continue to move forward as WCLC and continue to support WCLC's efforts. I now want to invite up the Secretary General of WCLC, Reverend Bruce Grodner, for just a few announcements before our closing prayer.
Thank you, Reverend Holmes. Yeah, we have a few announcements. We'd like to just a um, couple of save the dates. Uh, we have Reverend George Agude is on with us. Uh, he's the uh, uh, he's organizing the IAPD Africa uh, in collaboration with WCLC. That'll take place Wednesday, May fourth. I believe it's at eleven a.m. in the in the morning. Uh, yes, our time. Is that correct? I can't see it on my screen, sorry. And uh, we'll go to the next uh, the next save the date, which is uh, the World Christian Leadership Conference, WCLC Canada's webinar. It's on Tuesday, May 17th at 5 p.m. That's New York time. And we really uh, encourage you. All these will be up on our website. And, and if anybody misses anything, We'll have these programs also on our website. So, so our uh, next uh, webinar will be May twenty fifth. That's Wednesday. It's always the it's always the last Wednesday of the month, and it's usually always at nine a.m. in New York time. And uh, so that'll happen again uh, next uh, in May twenty fifth. Uh, uh, of course, Wednesday. And we just like to encourage, you know, where WCLC has many projects and ideas and we want to work with the nations and the continents. And so please feel free to uh, support in any way you can with your time, effort. Um, and, and we are having incredible, like our translators have been really investing their time. But please, uh, if you'd like to donate, uh, you can either um, uh, take a picture of this uh, uh, this queue, um, and it's uh, also you can just go to wclc.org uh, forward slash donate. And uh, I think it'd be really anyway great, uh, Dr. Kim. I will I will begin to donate every month to to support, <laughs> and I I encourage uh, anyone who really feels inspired. Uh, with this kind of work and this collaboration to bring not only America and the North America, but but the world together as we are the World Christian Leadership Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Bruce Grodner, for those announcements. And yes, please feel encouraged to donate to support these efforts. It's a powerful programming that WCLC is involved in. And yes, if you want to see any of these announcements, you can go to wclc.org. My wife does an awesome job of updating it regularly, amen, uh, and keeping you all in the loop with how God is working through this organization. To lead us in our closing prayer, I want to invite up Reverend Iona smith NZ. She's the, path, uh, the pastor of Bethel AME Church in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is the oldest African-American church in Bridgeport. She is a history maker with an extensive background in holding major positions, both in sacred and secular uh, areas. But one, she says, says outweighs them all, has to be that she is a mother. So please help me in welcoming up Reverend Smith and Z for our closing prayer. Good morning, Ms. Minister Holmes, to Dr. Kim, Dr. Ward, Dr. Lay, to, uh, to Mrs. Duggan, Dr. Edwards, and Dr. Gradner. It is pleasure to be here and to join you this morning from the sunny state today anyway of Connecticut. Um, Solomon had a lot to say at the end of his life in Ecclesiastes 3, things that he had seen and things that he understood and, and paid attention to and watched. And if I may, I'll just read an excerpt before I pray. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter, scatter stones and a time to gather a time to embrace and a time to refrain from dance, from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, 
a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Let us pray. Mm -hmm. Most merciful God, we come before you this day in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And we have confessions to make. We confess that war, the word alone, produces a range of emotions from horror to imagination and admiration. And we ask God that you would forgive us. We confess that the world is fascinated by war and can find in war excitement and glamor. We confess that war's effects have been so profound that to leave it out is to ignore one of the great forces hmm, of uh, like global warming and racism and classism, geography and economics and social and political change. We confess that war raises fundamental questions about what it is to be human and about the essence of human society. We confess that war is an indelible part of human society woven in so that we understand from the time of our ancestors when they first began to organize themselves into social groups, war was present. Mm -hmm. We confess the mark of Cain, a curse put on us which condemns us to repeated conflict. We confess, God, that there have been times when the absence of peace indicated a problem we were willing to walk away from. But today, we embrace an ideal or the idea of it. We embrace the idea that knowing God is the best education. We acknowledge that oligarchy, monarchy, and democracy, in their own way, right, and time, deliver the goods. We embrace marriage and the opportunity to create stability in every society by the presence of a husband and a wife and a mother and a father over every family. We embrace the opportunity to have uh, webinars like this, though intellectual in nature, spiritual and religious at its foundation. And so we celebrate. We celebrate as we see the day approaching. We celebrate as we see um, that the that God and Jesus are in the middle of it all, just as the two sinners were on the outside. We, we embrace the and celebrate the opportunity to recognize that our personal relationships will be the very thing that help us to continue to move forward toward a peace, a world peace that all of us can play a role in. And while we, are in the midst of understanding that the war in Russia, between Russia and Ukraine continue to live on day by day, side by side with COVID. We recognize that you are giving us a message and that we should understand that sickness in the body is sickness in the mind and sickness in the mind is sickness in the land. Mm. But we also celebrate this one thing, we celebrate that now we are the sons and daughters of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when God appears, we shall be like God, for we shall see God as he is. Amen. 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 Adju, Reverend Hyona Smith and Z, thank you so much for your prayer. And to everybody, thank you for joining today's webinar. And we are so grateful for you uh, joining us and, and being a part of this experience. Every month, we are here at the last Wednesday uh, of the month. I want to say a special thank you to Dr. Kihun Kim, to all of our panelists, to Minister Laura Young and the KCLC, the Reverend Dr. Suman Kim, who's here with us, and of course, Dr. Jenkins, Dr. Luan Abram Rouse, and all of our distinct and honorable leaders from around the world. We are grateful for you. Thank you so much. Let's continue to march forward centered on God. God bless you. We love you. Thank you. <laughs>